Hello everyone, I'm Paula and I'm a second year PhD student at the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Tech. I work in the group of Sean McLean at LC and my research interests are in the fields of extremophile microbiology and computational biology. The title of my talk today is Single Cell and Genomically Resolved Analytical Techniques Elucidate Metabolic Adaptations of Methanogenic Archaea to Varying Temperatures. I will walk you through this step by step. Looking at my title, the first thing you might be wondering is why should we even be interested in methanogens? Well, methanogens may have been some of the earliest life forms on Earth. Looking at some of the major events that led to life as we know it today, starting with the moon forming impact 4.5 billion years ago, to ocean formation, and the first isotopic signatures of life 4.1 billion years ago, methanogenesis and sulfate reduction are the earliest metabolisms for which we have direct isotopic evidence at 3.5 billion years ago, before we can find signs of photosynthesis and later on the great oxidation event. Looking at the evolution of biological processes and atmospheric oxygen and methane, on an early Earth without oxygen and an environment that is hostile to most modern life forms, methanogenesis enabled other non-photosynthetic prokaryotic metabolisms, such as methanotrophy, to thrive, which then in turn paved the way for photosynthetic primary producers and later on eukaryotes. But what exactly is methanogenesis? In simple terms, it is the biological production of methane through one of three major pathways. First, we have hydrogenotrophic methanogenesis, which uses carbon dioxide as substrate and hydrogen as electron donor, resulting in methane and water formation. Second, acetoclastic methanogenesis, where acetate is split by oxidizing the carboxyl group to carbon dioxide and reducing the methyl group to methane. And third, methylotrophic methanogenesis, with methanol or methylamines as substrates, where electrons are gained through the oxidation of an additional methyl group to carbon dioxide. So, with four methyl groups as input, you will end up with three molecules of methane. Today, methanogens are found in various environments such as animal rumens, seafloor sediments, subglacial lakes, or industrial plants. And in recent years, in addition to the substrates mentioned here, more and more additional substrates such as alkenes have been identified for use by methanogens, but that is a different story. In addition to their wide substrate utilization shown in part on the previous slide, methanogens also have wide growth temperature ranges. For my project, I have classified them into three temperature groups. We have psychotolerant organisms with a minimum growth temperature of 15 degrees Celsius or less, which are shown to the left of or touching the blue line in this plot, thermotolerant organisms with a maximum growth temperature equal to or above 45 degrees Celsius, which are either to the right of the red line or touching the red line, and then finally mesosphilic organisms, which are all organisms in between the two lines and everything touching both lines. The total temperature range is from minus 2.5 degrees Celsius observed in an Antarctic lake organism to 120 degrees Celsius observed in an organism isolated from a black smoker wall. It is worth mentioning here that there are no universal definitions for psychophilic, psychotolerant, thermotolerant or thermophilic temperature cutoffs, and the thresholds here were set based on the overall distributions within this group of organisms. Now let's have a look at the phylogeny of the organisms. I defined methanogens as every archaeum containing methyl coenzyme M reductase, short MCR, alpha, beta and gamma subunits which were a total of 295 organisms. This here is a subset of those that have temperature data available, which is a set I'm showing in the following analyses as well. There are a total of 86 organisms. The shapes in the tree indicate the different substrates, where the colored boxes represent the temperature classes. We can see that temperatures and substrates are distributed throughout the phylogenetic tree, and that the only real trend that we can observe is that there are no acetoclastic psychotolerant organisms. When seeing these wide temperature ranges, you might be wondering what mechanisms allow methanogens to inhabit such a wide range of environments, and how can we find those mechanisms? In my thesis work, I'm looking at methanogens' genomes with respect to their composition, function, and structure. This is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this presentation. I'm also interested in the physiological adaptations, and I'm doing single-cell analysis of organisms grown at different temperatures to investigate to what extent individual cells in the population differ from one another. So let's have a look at the genome data, and if you're interested in the physiology part, please contact me later. I started by splitting the genome of each of the 86 species into their core and pan genomes. The core is shared by all organisms in this analysis and appears in blue in the plot, while the pan genome consists of genes that are not present in every single organism, but in some of them. The pan genome can further be divided into unique genes that only appear in exactly one species and are in green here in this plot, and shared genes, which appear in at least two but not all of the species, and which are the orange fraction. In this plot, each bar represents one organism, and the core of all of the organisms consists of 225 genes, 
which in size of the whole genome is between 5% and 15%. That is actually relatively small. So where are the adaptive mechanisms that we are looking for? Are they in the core and the pan genome? We next had a look at the composition and structure of proteins of each core, shared, and unique gene groups to find out more since we cannot see a clear trend in the phylogeny from the previous slide or the genome composition on this slide. I will first show you amino acid compositions of each of the fractions. We are looking at amino acid substitutions because they cause structural changes to the proteins that can cause an increase of decrease in flexibility and stability of the protein which is important in different temperature environments. So for example, psychophilic proteins have a higher flexibility and lower thermal stability compared to their mesosphilic counterparts. We found that the observed substitutions follow the expectations that we get from the literature with the conserved core and variable unique proteins. So let me walk you through each of the fractions one by one, starting with the overall genome composition. This plot shows the differences in thermotolerant and cyclotolerant species with respect to individual amino acids calculated from the overall mean appearance of an amino acid to all thermotolerant and cyclotolerant species respectively. A positive value means that the amino acid is more abundant in the cyclotolerant ones while a negative value means that the amino acid is more abundant in thermotolerant organisms. Looking at all genes together, the core plus pan genomes, so this is the black bar here, we see some differences which are not too pronounced. The main differences are higher glutamic acid and lysine and thermos, and higher serine and threonine and cyclotolerant species. But those differences are mostly within the 1% range. Next, let's look at the individual genome components, starting with the core. The differences are similar to that of the overall genome, even a bit less pronounced than in the whole genome. The trend for the shared fraction of the genome is very similar as well. So finally, let's look at the uniques. And here we can see that the differences are more pronounced than the other fractions that we looked at before. When we compare all of this data side by side, we can see that indeed the unique fraction has the most pronounced differences in amino acid composition, sometimes even a completely opposite trend as the other genome fractions. Let's see if we can observe a similar trend in protein domain architectures. The architectures will tell us about the orientation of secondary structures of protein folds. The core here is very, very conserved, which you can see in the absence of the blue bars. There are some differences in the shared fraction, but the most pronounced differences, again, are in the unique fraction. And in addition to this plot, this is not displayed here, but one important thing to note is that when it comes to the mapping coverage of the genes, the unique genes were actually not all mapped. Only a small fraction of them had an architecture mapping onto them, which means that they need more attention if we want to find out more about their structure and function. So finally, what does this data tell us? Basically, it tells us that the core is very conserved when it comes to amino acid composition, meaning flexibility and rigidity, and protein domain architectures, meaning secondary structures. We know very little about the unique genes, even though some of them might hold keys to the thermal adaptation mechanisms of methanogens. So if we want to find out more about those, we will need molecular biology studies. And then finally, what is next for me? I have a bit more data to go through in um, this project such as gene phylogenies for the core genes from which we can relate the connection between temperatures and evolutionary rates. And I'm also interested in the hypothesis of thermal reduction, which was first introduced by Fortier more than 20 years ago. As I mentioned in the beginning, I'm also looking at the physiology of individual cells through laboratory experiments, and ultimately my plan is to link the genome potential with the observed phenotypic variations. If you're interested in any of this, I'd be happy to meet up virtually during or after the conference as well. On this slide, I've just listed some of the references I used for my figures. If you're interested, you can read further here. Thank you for watching my presentation until the end. You can find me during the conference, either on GatherTown during the Japanese afternoon session, or message me through Discord at any time. Thanks again and hopefully talk to you soon.